going to get started and there will probably be some more people joining. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome from a sunny autumn London morning and a hot, by the sound of it, uh, moving into winter day in uh, Taiwan. Uh, lovely to see so many familiar faces and also new faces. Um, I am Marion Fixler and uh, as you know, Oren Kaviti, many of you will have already met him or read his material or maybe studied with him. Um, and uh, I just wanted to give a brief little introduction to those of you who don't know Oren. Um, as I said, Oren lives in um, Taiwan now and uh, he's a, actually a British registered acupuncturist and uh, started his training back in 1987. So he calls himself a veteran acupuncturist. Um, and uh, I've um, known Oren since the 1990s, I think it is. And uh, we've been doing lots of training together. So I've really kind of watched and seen Oren's uh, kind of evolution, particularly with regard to um, uh, all the innovation that he's done in relation to Antake. So you're in for a real treat today. And uh, Oren's really bringing together um, his knowledge and experience of all those decades of study and um, innovation from his original training in Europe and then studying in China and then J Japan and Japanese acupuncture training, which we started actually in 1998, I think it was, with Dr. Manaka. So there's a real thread running through all that of integrating works from Dr. Manaka, and that's what he's really um, developed in terms of integrating Hirata zones into warm bamboo. Um, we also did a 10 day tween our um, residential together and a lot of the techniques of um, uh, Antake warm bamboo bring in kind of tween our type applications um, in terms of uh, stimulation, different types of stimulation. So he, as you will probably know, he teaches internationally. He's got a whole series of workshops luckily coming up in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, in Belgium and in Switzerland in November. So there'll be lots of opportunities if you're interested to take this further. Um, and uh, he's also written a number of wonderfully accessible books on warm bamboo and on take and now on Hirata zones and is working on another book, um, hopefully coming out next year. Um, but just to say that whatever style of acupuncture you're coming from, I recognize lots of people from Toyohari and Manaka systems, but whatever style of acupuncture you're studying, I think you will find that this is a wonderfully user-friendly technique that you can integrate into whatever style of acupuncture um, you study. And um, having worked with Oren for many years, I can vouch for the fact that he's a wonderful teacher and makes everything very accessible, as you will see this, after, uh, this morning. So I'll hand you over to Oren, and uh, hopefully he can now take you on in terms of uh, introducing to Hirata Zone therapy with warm bamboo. Uh, thank you very much, Marion. Uh, it's funny, I sometimes don't recognize myself in people's descriptions, but Marion and I have worked together for so many years, I think I, I do. Um, so I'm going to uh, start off with a PowerPoint and uh, we'll talk with that for a while. Uh, and then I'll kind of stop sharing the screen and we'll go to Q&A and then we might return to the PowerPoint later. So hopefully you can all see um, a slide there. Can Marion can give me a thumbs up if you can see a slide? Yes. OK, great. So we're, we're on. Um, on the right is Kurakichi Hirata. Um, and on the left uh, is an image of Onontake, uh, a piece of bamboo with moxa smoldering inside. And uh, what we're going to talk about is how we can integrate this amazing moxibustion tool with this uh, classical uh, 20th century therapy. Um, now, before I go any further, I'd like to say thank you to Marion Fixler uh, for organising the London workshops that um, will be next month, and Michael Huber for organising the workshops in Munich uh, next month as well. Uh, so thank you to both of you. Um, now, practical thing, have you got the handout? Uh, so um, with various degrees of proficiency, I managed to get uh, an email out to some of you saying that there's a handout available. So uh, there's a link in the chat room. And Marion, maybe you could copy and paste that link 
that was further up in the chat and put it into the chat now for those people who've just arrived. Uh, or if you have a phone, you can scan this barcode on your computer and you'll get the link uh, for the handout there. Um, so the handout, uh, if, if, if we have your email and you're getting that, if you've got the handout, we've got your email, which means that we'll be able to send you the replay link uh, if, if you want to see this lecture again. So do, um, do make sure that we have your email uh, by um, downloading the handout. Okay, um, I was going to spend a bit of time introducing myself, but I'm going to skip this slide just for brevity's sake, uh, because Marion's done such a good job of introducing me anyway. And I'll introduce instead uh, uh, a cast of characters, starting off with uh, Kurakichi Hirata. Um, so he was born in 1901, and he died in the Second World War, uh, 1945. And he was... Uh, I think we can call him a medical rebel. There's been a, a biography of him published in Japan, uh, which called, is entitled just that, Kurakichi Hirata, a rebel of traditional medicine. So he was um, a medical student, and uh, but he was very intelligent, he was very idealistic, and he was very creative in many areas. And he was interested in martial arts and he interested in posture. And uh, you can see here, this is one of his postures for stretching the meridians. And he wanted to create a treatment system that fulfilled two conditions that Western medicine did not. So he was a, a medical student. He really didn't like the Western medicine that he was studying. He just thought it was kind of symptomatic and all the things that you and I uh, have criticized Western medicine for before. Um, it didn't uh, address the fundamental energy or regenerative properties of the body. So he wanted to create a system that did that. It had to trigger the body's own healing responses, number one. And secondly, it had to empower people to treat themselves at home. So he was very idealistic. He had this goal. He wanted to create a system that people could use on their own to, um, to, to trigger their own body's healing responses. Um, now, his model of disease was strongly influenced by traditional East Asian medicine, by team ideas of heaven, person, and earth. So uh, he felt, you know, this idea of uh, Tian Ren Di, uh, that we are in between heaven and earth, and therefore all these things uh, play on us, on our body, and particularly the skin is the doorway to uh, the environment. So the skin is the interface between human beings and the natural world. It's the place where diseases enter, and it's also the place where you can see reactions taking place. So his whole therapy was based on treating the skin. And for this reason, um, uh, you know, he focused on the skin, and his method focused on stimulating the skin with heat. Uh, so he developed, his first book was called Hot Needle Therapy. Um, and uh, hang on a minute, I'm just going to move everybody's faces out of the way of my lecture notes. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's better. Yeah. So um, you can see that this, this rendition or this, this illustration of his tool, it was basically, it was a conical tube of metal uh, with, a, with a wooden handle. And it was lined with asbestos and it was filled with alcohol, which he lit. And then he tapped the bottom end, the spiky end on the skin. Um, so very focused kind of heat. And everyone who bought the book got a free one of these, they're called Shin Ryoki, uh, uh, with the book. And his book was incredibly successful. Um, it was whilst he was at medical school, uh, and it was reprinted, can you believe, 40 times in the first month. So it was like the 1930s equivalent of a Twitter storm. It was like uh, an incredibly popular book, and it spread throughout Japan, and it really pissed off the people at the university, and he was expelled for being too famous. So um, you can see that this device, you know, it might not get approved by uh, regulatory bodies these days, um, maybe it would be considered unsafe. Uh, 
So you can see that though it was a very successful device, it just we couldn't use it today. Junji Mitsutani, who's the editor of the North American Journal of uh, Oriental Medicine, he tried it out on himself uh, and he, he wrote this about it. I actually tried this device out on myself. I didn't reference Hirata zones, but instead just treated tight areas with the mind therapy device. Mind therapy is the translation of Shinryoki. The feeling of the treatment was brief, stinging, sharp sensations. And the next day there were many small burns about two millimeters across. So um, kind of quite a strong kind of stimulating tool. Well, uh, unfortunately, Hirata died, uh, but one of his students carried on his work. Um, that's not his student on the right, that's his student's model, uh, uh, Shichiko. Uh, and then his writings were picked up by the next character in the story, who uh, many of you will have heard of, uh, Yoshio Manaka. So Dr. Manaka was a very renowned Japanese medical doctor and acupuncturist. And uh, he combined scientific research skills with a fascination for traditional methods of healing. Uh, and he studied Hirata's uh, methods. And actually, he was so enthused by them that 40 years after his death, uh, after Hirata's death, he published his own book about uh, the method and he integrated it into his approach. So it was a it was um, uh, part of his four step protocol, he would always use the Hirata zones. Um, and he invented, he even invented his own heat application tool called a tension cue. So it was like an electronically heated spiked roller. Um, now, after Dr. Manica's death, again, these weren't really available. And uh, there was another device available, but it was uh, nearly a thousand US dollars to buy. So obviously, this therapy didn't spread. Um, now, the next character I want to introduce you to, I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, and that is Stephen Birch. Um, and Stephen Birch was um, uh, Marion's teacher and my teacher and mentor. And um, he has shared from the cup of knowledge very often. There he is sharing from the cup of knowledge. And uh, he's a British acupuncturist. He's an author, he's a teacher. And he collaborated with Dr. Manica in the 1980s. And he produced Chasing the Dragon's Tail, uh, which was written by Stephen uh, with Dr. Manica's input and guidance. Now, uh, Stephen is the first person to talk about um, Hirata's own therapy in English. He and uh, Kiko Matsumoto, they talk about it in Hara Diagnosis briefly. They talk about it in Chasing the Dragon's Tail, but uh, in very thumbnail form. It's kind of like the information is there, but you couldn't really kind of go away and practice it from what's in the books. And whilst I haven't actually discussed this with Stephen, um, I think that the reason he hasn't taught Hirata's own therapy in any detail is because there was no heat application tool readily available. Um, so there was no point to teach it because no one could use it. Uh, so when he heard that I was doing on Take, he, he wrote to me by email and said, look, you know, you should, um, you should um, try and research the Hirata zones. And actually I've got a chapter, an unpublished chapter on Hirata zones that I can give you. And then we met up and um, the conversation went something like this. It's, I've got this little idea. Why don't you go and research using Ontakis for the Hirata zones? And it won't take long, honest. And I fell for that. And uh, 12 years later, here we are. Um, now, I'm assuming that most of you know what Ontake is. Uh, but uh, perhaps some of you don't. So you're going to here's a like a 20 second video of what Antake is. It's essentially it's a piece of bamboo and you fill it full of moxa and you compress the moxa in so it's nice and tight and it can't fall out. And you can even use a little rod to to kind of tamp it down so that it's uh, nice and even and nice and firm. Then you light it and the whole thing becomes warm and then you can apply it rhythmically either with the lighted end or you can roll with the side of the um, the bamboo. So it's a very simple um, heat application tool. 
Uh, it's like a very light and uh, mobile moxa box. And it's, it's very rhythmic because it's so small, it's so light, and it's very simple to use, and it's very safe to apply. Um, now, it's been used as a branch tool in Japan, possibly from the 1960s. So it's very, very recent as a tool. It's not like, you know, got a long history going back hundreds or thousands of years. And the first time it's mentioned in print is in a Japanese textbook in the 1990s. So you can see it's really been around a short, a short, it's really the new kid on the block as far as moxibustion techniques are concerned. Um, so I first came across this tool in 2009. And uh, about 10 years later, I published Moxer in Motion, my first book. Uh, which is all about using on take. Um, so it's easy to learn and it's easy to teach on take. Now my second book, um, because there wasn't really room in the first book to talk about Hirata zones, uh, my second book was all about how to apply on take with the Hirata zones. And I spent a lot of time deconstructing Hirata's approach uh, and Manika's approach and then kind of repurposing them for contemporary practice. So let's get to the meat and potatoes of this, because in this workshop, what I want you to do is to um, satisfy your curiosity. So what is Ontake? What are the Hirata zones? And what are their uses? What is the value of them to us as practitioners? Um, so we'll start off with talking about holographic systems, because this is really a kind of holographic moxibustion system. Um, so we'll try and figure out what those things mean. Um, holographic models or holographic systems are basically, um, I'll quote from someone called uh, Dale, uh, a three-dimensional image of a given object which contains the information of the object in itself and in every part of itself. So every single part of the body is a microcosm of the whole. Um, so the most famous of these is foot reflexology. And you can see from the diagram that the feet roughly um, are equivalent to the whole body. So the, the big toe is level with the head and the spine is kind of where the two feet join together if you're lying in bed, you know, with your feet touching. Um, and then another very famous uh, uh, holographic system is the ear which I hope you're all familiar with. So you know that there's the, the idea of the, the, the baby, upside down baby in the earlobe is the kind of baby's head and then the, the helix is the uh, baby's spine. So there's a kind of, so the, the, the whole person is in the ear. And actually uh, the back shoe points are another holographic system. And you know you have, uh, but rather than being on a, a micro system, they're actually on a one to one scale. So if you look at the back shoe points uh, around the upper back, you've got the lungs and you've got the pericardium and the heart. And if you go down to the middle part of the back, you've got the spleen and stomach and liver and gallbladder. And if you go further down, then you've got back shoe points for the kidney and the bladder. So the back shoe points are also a holographic system. Um, now, we often think that holographic systems were basically pioneered by Nogier, um, but it turns out that Hirata came up with his own holographic mappings of the body um, in the 1930s, so 30 years before uh, Nogier. Um, and his holographic mappings consist of 12 horizontal zones, which repeat in six regions, so the head, the face, the neck, the arm, the leg, and the torso. And I don't want, I want, want to try and make one of these practical for you. So um, we can just practice that together now. So uh, first of all, you've got 12 regions and I'll tell you what they are. So the first is the bronchi, and then we've got going down lung, heart, liver, gallbladder, which also relates to the exocrine gland of the pancreas, spleen, and the endocrine gland of the pancreas, stomach, kidney, large intestine, small intestine, bladder, and reproductive area. So you can see that um, they don't quite correspond to the 12 channels, um, but 10 of them do. And then 1 and 12 are slightly different. Um, 
So there's no triple her tri triple burner in pericardium. Instead, we've got bronchi and reproductive area. Um, and I mentioned that there were um, six regions. So the face, the head, the neck, and the arm. So let's just talk about the arm. What I'd like you to do is just to put your hand over your deltoid muscle. So um, if you're touching the deltoid muscle and the, your little finger is more or less level with the um, mid axillary, the, the axillary crease, then that's zone one. And then exactly if you're an acupuncturist, you know how to uh, to find uh, lung three and four, you know, we divide that um, area between the axillary fold and the cubital crease, we divide it into three. So those three areas are actually zones two, three and four. So just touch that on your arm, you can touch zone one, and then you can move down a little bit, you can touch zone two, and then you can move down a bit, that's zone three, and then you're just at where if your little finger is touching the cubital crease, you're at um, zone four, which is the liver one. Then if you want to find the zones on the arm, uh, on the forearm, then you just divide the forearm into four. So exactly as you would if you were doing measuring um, to find acupuncture points, you just divide that into half and then again into quarters. So you've got four zones on the forearm. And then the hand, uh, you've got the wrist crease is your uh, main landmark. And then the next landmark is the knuckles. And essentially you divide that first area uh, of the hand into two. And that gives you zones uh, nine and 10. And then from the knuckles to the interphalangeal joint gives you 11. And then the, the rest of the fingers is 12. So very simple. Um, and the feet are, are the same, that you basically divide the thigh into four, the calf into four, and then the feet, the foot into four uh, units. Now, acupuncture and moxibustion is very precise, particularly when we're putting needles, you know, we want to try and really find the point. And then when we're doing moxa, we really palpate for an induration if you're doing direct moxa. But using the uh, Hirata zones is not so precise. So you don't really need to fret too much about, oh, am I exactly on zone one or am I exactly on zone two? Um, uh, you just uh, you just cover the area with the ontake. And the analogy I give to students is like this, is like when you're doing acupuncture, you're like Salvador Dali, you're holding a palette and you're using a very fine brush and you're painting very precisely on your canvas. But when you're doing Hirata zones with a ontake, you're more like a painter and decorator rolling on the on the wall. So you're covering these broad areas or broad lines. So it's not so precise. So let's just uh, embody that one more time. Can I just get you to tap on zone one and tap on zone two and tap on zone three and now four. Keep going. Five, six, seven and eight, you should be just above the wrist crease. And now just using two fingers, tap on 10, 11, 12. Okay, I think I lost count there as I was tapping, but there you go, uh, you get the picture. Uh, landmarks are very important. If you look at the cubital crease, if you go up one, you're at zone four. If you go down one, you're at zone five. So you know exactly where you are when you look at the elbow. And the same with the wrist crease. If you go proximal to the wrist crease, you're at zone eight, the kidney zone. If you go distal to the wrist crease, you're at zone nine. Um, so the landmarks are very easy to orient yourself. And once you know your creases, then you know where you are exactly. So, oh, look, I just go one up, that's this zone. If I go one up from that, that's that zone. So um, finding the zones is really quite a simple matter. Okay, let's uh, carry on. Um, so look, you've got all these regions and all these zones. So that's really a lot, isn't it? Whoops. Um, so let's talk about models of treatment and uh, how we can start to identify these, um, what to do. Um, 
In my book, uh, I found it easier to divide Hirata's own therapy, particularly because Hirata's own therapy evolved over time. It evolved, first of all, what, with what Hirata did, and then it evolved with what Manika did, and then there's stuff that people are doing now. So what I call basic Hirata's own therapy is the simplest model, and I'll talk about that most today. And then there's something I call intermediate Hirata's own therapy, uh, which is basically uh, something that Manika developed, particularly. And then there's complex or contemporary um, Hirata's own therapy, which is kind of anything goes. You can make it as complicated as you like. Uh, so let's talk about a progression of ideas over time. What is basic Hirata's own therapy? Basically, Hirata's first book was a medicalized model. He was a medical student, and though he did martial arts and was very aware of traditional East Asian medicine, I believe that he was slightly closeted about using uh, East Asian medicine, and he wanted to um, to make things very medicalized. So his his basic model was very very simple, and then he developed uh, he started to integrate the Meridian system, and this was followed up by Dr. Manica. And instead of calling them meridians, he called them extension lines and flexion lines. So I think he was still trying to kind of not be traditional medicine oriented. So basically integrating the channels into the zones. And Dr. Manica got very excited about the zones because he thought that they made them three dimensional. And I'll, 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 I'll talk about how Manica's three dimensional ideas later. And finally, there's complex Hirata zone therapy, which is kind of what I practice, I guess, which is um, using all kinds of things like integrating yin yang polarities, uh, integrating channel pairs uh, over the mappings, and even integrating Dr. Manica's meridian frequencies. So a lot to consider. Um, so there are just so many zones and regions. So how do you go about choosing one? Uh, so yeah, you need a system to narrow it down. And the system is already in place. Uh, for those of you who've ever come across auricular therapy, the principles of treatment are exactly the same. Um, now, to understand how we go about selecting a zone, there are three criteria. Uh, and let's think about ear acupuncture. So if you have someone um, a patient with kidney disease and you want to treat them with auricular therapy, the first thing you needle is the kidney point. If they have hepatitis, you, live, you needle the liver point. If they have wheezing, you needle the lung point. So in other words, uh, Western medicine is uh, the main criteria. And it's the same for Hirata zones. So for liver problems, we just treat the liver zone. For kidney problems, we treat the kidney zone. And for heart problems, we treat the heart zone. So very simple. Uh, now, the next thing, excuse me, it's getting dark here. I'm going to turn on the light. There you go. Um, now, the next thing uh, to consider is uh, in auricular therapy, uh, we think, well, if someone's very anxious, we needle Shen Men on the ear. So in other words, we start to think about the ear and in terms of its correspondences to traditional East Asian medicine. Uh, and there's a liver yang point. So you start to think about the ear, not just in Western terms, but also in terms of um, acupuncture terms. And that's why uh, the same principles apply to Hirata zone therapy. So for eye problems, you treat the liver zone, for example, because the liver opens into the eye. For memory problems, uh, then you treat the kidney zone. And for sweating problems, maybe the heart zone or maybe maybe the lung zone. So that's the second way of using the uh, Hirata zones. And the final way is the same with ear acupuncture. Ear acupuncture, if someone's got a pain in the neck, then you needle the neck point. If they've got a pain in the fingers, then you needle the finger point. So in other words, the location of the pain is very important for choosing your point. And the same principles apply with Hirata zone therapy. So, for example, uh, you've already learned that the deltoid is in zone one. 
So if someone has pain in zone one in the deltoid, you know, frozen shoulder, then you would start to treat zone one in other regions, like you might treat zone one on the foot, or you might treat zone one on the neck or on the head. So you just choose the same zone in another region. So location is the criteria. Um, the sacrum, I'll give you something for nothing, is that the, the zones that go through the sacrum are 10 and 11. And I, as a mnemonic, you can change the spelling of 11 to 11, U-M, so it rhymes with sacrum. So to treat the sacrum, treat zones 10 and 11, uh, which you might remember are here on the hand, 10 and 11. Um, so those are ways that we can, uh, the three criteria, the three ways that we can select the zone, either through Western medicine correlations, traditional East Asian medicine correlations, or location. Now I'd like to uh, more or less finish with some case examples. So here's um, uh, a case uh, that I had uh, someone with persistent cough and lower backache. Um, he said it was a mystery cough, um, but actually uh, at the time I was living in Kuala Lumpur and we have a, a kind of seasonal pollution, uh, it's called the haze and it comes in every summer, which is when people burning off uh, the rainforest in Indonesia. Uh, so it wasn't really a mystery when I asked him when did it start, said, oh it started a couple of weeks ago, oh that's when the haze started. but. Uh, he also had intermittent uh, lumbar pain, so he uh, had lumbar pain. So um, Hirata's prescriptions for cough focus very much on zone one, which is the bronchi zone. So um, it was obvious that we were going to treat zone one in order to treat this cough. And uh, the lumbar area is nine and ten, zones nine and ten. So. I started looking for reactions in zones one, nine, and 10 in different regions. Uh, there were rough patches on his arm and on his chest in zones one and two, bronchi and lungs. And what I did is I applied uh, ontake onto those areas, those rough areas on his chest um, and on the upper arm. And I kept doing ontake until the skin luster changed. So this is a concept that I um, talk about a lot in the book, is that um, when you apply ontake, the feeling of the skin changes. So if it feels rough, if you apply ontake, it starts to feel smooth, which means the chi is flowing better. And then I looked at the thighs, uh, and the thighs in zone 9 and 10 were very stiff, so I rolled on them. Uh, so zones nine and 10 on the thigh are just above the knee and then just above that. So uh, this had a very good result. Um, and then we turned him over and we worked on his back. And so uh, there were some more dry and rough areas in zones one and two. So no other treatment was given. So no acupuncture, no moxibustion, just on take on the zones. So immediately afterwards, he reported that um, the knee pain, the back pain was better, and he'd had some knee pain, which he hadn't disclosed. He said that also felt much better. Um, the cough cleared for a few days, but as the pollution got worse, it came back again. So he came back for more treatment. So just a simple treatment, just with bamboo and Hirata zones. You can see how effective that was. And it took about 15 minutes to do. Second patient, a uh, female. Um, uh, she had lumbar and buttock pain uh, and abdominal distension. So she'd been coming for acupuncture for a few weeks and she'd improved a lot. And then she'd just been on a conference in Japan and she'd flown back or she'd been doing long haul and then uh, she'd relapsed. So her back was bad and she had this abdominal distension. So uh, the location of the back pain was zones 9, 10 and 11. Remember I said 10 and 11? treat the sacrum, so uh, 9, 10, and 11. Uh, and if you think about acupuncture, when people have abdominal distension, it often corresponds to stomach and spleen channels. So that's zone six and seven. So those were our, um, the, the zones that I wanted to investigate and treat. And when I looked at her legs, she had a lot of tension at zones 10 and 11. So I started rolling on her thighs, just rolling on the uh, anterior thigh, so around spleen 10 and above that. 
And uh, both her legs got relaxed. And then I asked her to walk around the room and she said, oh, the back pain's much better. So then uh, I added zones 10 and 11 on the hands. And once again, I uh, got her to walk around the room. And this time she had no pain at all. So this treatment took about five to six minutes. Uh, then I thought, well, we need to do something for the distension. So I just did zone six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the abdomen. So just basically treating the abdomen and particularly on the stomach channel, focusing on the stomach channel and the spleen channel. And then I did a local treatment on the back and uh, that really by then she was feeling super relaxed. And then I finished off with a root treatment with Toyahari. Uh, so my branch treatment was Hirata zones and uh, the root treatment was Toyahari. So let me do a quick time check. Yeah, okay, we're doing okay. Um, one more case, a very simple one. A 32-year-old guy who started to get redness and itchiness in one eye, and it was so bad his eye was closing up. So in acupuncture theory, the liver opens into the eyes. So the treatment was very simple. I just did the liver zone in every region. So zone four on the head, arm, back, leg, just for one minute each. And the result was that within minutes, the infection and the redness started to clear. And within two hours, it was completely gone. So again, a very, very simple treatment according to uh, traditional East Asian medicine therapies. Now I'm gonna say a little bit more about intermediate heratazone therapy, but I won't say too much. Um, you can see from this diagram, uh, let me get the pointer out, um, that uh, the meridian systems are, as we know them, are a longitudinal system. But when you layer them over a transverse system, the grid, what you come up with was a three-dimensional grid. So Dr. Manaka was very excited. He said that the the meridian system, the whole acupuncture system is up and down. The only horizontal meridian is daimai. So what the Hirata zones do is they add a new dimension to treatment. And he said that rather than treating the whole zone, so here's the liver zone, here's the gallbladder zone. So just above the cubital crease is the liver, just below the cubital crease is the gallbladder. So he said, rather than treat the whole zone, you just treat the relevant meridian where it intersects the zone. So supposing you were treating pericardium, you don't treat, um, you don't treat the whole liver zone, you just treat where the pericardium crosses the liver zone. So that was Manika's big idea. Uh, so it was a kind of economy. Uh, and he was very excited about this three dimensional thing. And I interviewed a, a Hirata zone practitioner in Japan called Yokoyama Sensei. And what he says is that the zones are an extension of the horizontal quality of the daimai. So they're, they're, they're basically, he says that the Hirata zones are um, an aspect of the daimai. So you can see there's just lots of little daimais all over the body. Finally, uh, complex Hirata zone therapy. It's basically anything goes. Now there's um, a lot of you in this group right now, and a lot of you will be watching the replay and you all have different approaches to acupuncture. Every single one of us do. Uh, some of you do Dr. Tan therapy, some of you do Toyahari, some of you do Manika, some of you do TCM, but we all come with a different mindset. So you can integrate anything you know into the zones. Um, so for example, I like to use uh, Dr. Tan's balance method he uses a lot of channel pairings and he has a holographic mapping which he calls normal image and reverse image but you can just take out his holographic mapping and swap in Hirata's mapping and then you can use the same kind of pairings or you can use Dr. Manika's meridian frequencies and you could use a metronome and apply the Ontake uh, with a meridian frequency so anything goes with uh, complex Hirata zone therapy. I can also call it contemporary Hirata zone therapy. Now I'd like to finish by saying, talking a little bit about the value of Hirata zone therapy in clinic. And I think, uh, as you can see, the three on Take there, and there are three ways in which you can use it. The first is an, as an adjunctive treatment. 
In other words, you do what you normally do every day and you add it in to give momentum to your treatment. So uh, if you're doing uh, a TCM treatment and you decide that someone is spleen deficient, then you can do the spleen zones. Um, if you're doing uh, a manica treatment and you decide that you want to accelerate the treatment, what you're doing, you can, and, and you know, they've got a lot of mm, mm, tenderness under the subcostal area, then you could do the liver zone. So you can just add it to what you're doing and use it to augment what you already have done. The second way you can do it, as I talked about in uh, two of those cases, is you can use it as a treatment in itself. In other words, if you have a patient and you don't want to do acupuncture on them, you can just use hieratozones as the beginning and end of the treatment. So it's a very versatile and powerful moxibustion treatment uh, and can be used just on its own. But finally, and I think this really tunes into um, Hirata's original idea, is that you can give uh, patients on Teke and ask them, you can train them to do the zones at home. So you say, look, I really want you to, to treat your husband every day or to treat your wife every day or treat yourself every day with an Ontake. So you, you give them an Ontake, you give them some Moxa, and then you show them how to tap on the zones and it's such an easy moxibustion method. It's so simple to do it, so hard to actually injure yourself or cause burns. Uh, that there's a lot of um, patient um, compliance. They actually get on and they do it, and they come back next week and say, "Oh, you know, I was doing that. We, you know, me and my husband are swapping treatments, and we're really enjoying it." So it's a way to really empower patients to continue to treat themselves at home. Um, Okay, now originally this PowerPoint was for a book launch, so I'll just quickly show you the book. Uh, more than 90 years later, uh, I uh, wrote all this up in a book, but I, I won't dwell on that now, really. Um, I got very infected by Hirata's idealism, uh, and as I researched it, I really wanted to uh, come up with a system that was relevant to us in 21st century practice. So whilst it's not authentic, I'm not using his crazy um, alcohol fueled asbestos lined um, spiky needle device, uh, I'm using a wonderful Moxa device. So it's not completely authentic and of course it's been repurposed for contemporary practice, but it's a very effective system. And it really does empower patients to treat at home. So I think what I'll do uh, before I come to this slide, I'll stop sharing for a minute and see if we can go to questions. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Marion, you can unmute yourself and um, maybe okay. you can. Great, lovely. Thanks very much, Oren. And um, I think that was a wonderful overview and fitted a lot in in a very short space of time. Um, I'd like to invite people now to um, ask questions. Um, I can see a couple of thumbs up. I'm obviously going to have to go between pages, but um, if you have a question for Oren, um, please put your hand up and I'll try and kind of get around you. Um, and hopefully, you know, we can we can answer any questions in the time that we've got left. OK, so thanks very much, Oren. And uh, hope that gave everybody a really good overview. So anyone got any questions? Uh, I've got somebody called Uta raised her hand. Um, okay, Uta, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, how do you manage that with the with the moxibustion? Uh, how do you manage that with the with the bambus? Can you show us that how you how you uh, make it with the patient and how you uh, fill the the bambus with moxa? Right. Um, I think I can't really. Uh, I can I can show you a bamboo that I have, um, but it's not going to be very satisfactory. But I can point you in the direction of um, uh, uh, videos where you can see exactly how to load and light uh, on take. So this is an on take here, and you can see that it's filled with moxa um, almost to the edge, and the same at the other end. So uh, you light it. And because the plug is quite compressed, it doesn't fall out. So then you just apply it like that. Um, so yeah, I think um, uh, I will point you to some resources where you can learn that. Thank you, Uta. 
Also, I uh, just want one thing I did want to add, because I know here in the UK, there can often be issues about using Moxa in clinics, which is really sad because increasingly lots of people are not using Moxa, either because their clinic doesn't like it or they don't like it because the contra, because of the effects of smoke. The amazing thing about bamboo, which I kind of found, I don't really even understand it to this day, is you pack in all this Moxa and you light it and there's hardly any smoke. So I've used it in clinics where they don't really like um, smoke. I don't feel the smoke myself. I think that's a really important thing to point out because lots of people kind of end up thinking, oh, I'm not going to learn moxa techniques because I can't do them in my clinic. So there's very little um, smoke that comes when you first light it as a tiny little bit, but it's not billowing smoke out as you're using the moxa, uh, as you're using the bamboo. Um, before we go on to a couple of the raised hands, somebody asked, Margaret asked, um, are there any contraindications, for example, if there's heat or damp heat? Um, there are contraindications, um, and I think uh, Hirata wouldn't have seen things in terms of heat or damp heat. Um, that's a very big question, actually, and there's a there's a section on contraindications, but I'll give you the, the, the main contraindication, which is that if there is a lot of inflammation in the torso, so for example, someone has a um, con, um, liver disease, let's say, so you're treating someone with a liver disease, and there's a lot of hepatitis and inflammation, then you would not treat directly over the liver organ, even if it's in zone four, you would treat on the opposite side. So that's the main thing I would say. Um, but uh, Hirata was not thinking in terms of heat or damp heat. And uh, Ontake is certainly considered to be a stimulating therapy rather than a heating therapy. So you're working um, uh, with a diff very different theoretical model. Uh, one other question in the chat was what type of moxa do you use? Mm. Uh, I use medium grade moxa, so uh, the kind that you can get from Docsave uh, is, uh, called, or uh, Wakakusa moxa, so just a medium grade moxa, which is slightly, slightly yellow. It's not the really expensive one that you use for rolling tiny cones, and it's not the, the very twiggy green one that you get from China that you put in a moxa box. It's somewhere in the middle, so like a medium grade moxa. Uh, so there's not so much particulate matter there. Mm. I mean, here in the UK, um, you can go to places like Scarborough's, uh, Docsave, which are actually based in Germany, and also um, uh, Dulwich. They all do Wakakusa Japanese moxa. Mm. Um, so uh, um, I'd like to go to Marek because he's had his hand up and there are some other questions coming in. But Marek, do you want to ask your question? Unmute yourself. Hi, hi, Oren. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, nice to see you too. I, I know in Manica Star treatment, sometimes we incorporate open hour points or 60 day points or 10 day points. I wondered if you occasionally thought, okay, an open hour point happens to be in the Harata zone that I want to work with. Would that at all influence your way of thinking? Because sometimes, obviously, as, as a Manica practitioner, Sometimes that will go, oh, I'm going to do that pattern rather than another one, because one of the open hour points happens to be one of the points I'd be using. Right. That a bit too technical. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you know that hadn't that hadn't crossed my mind um, that open points might be in uh, in a Hirata zone? It just hadn't crossed my mind. So that's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, that's right. My new homework. All right. Thanks, Mary. I, I can't answer that. But I mean, yes, I think that's a, that's that's a nice idea because sometimes it's about layering of evidence. So, you know, you see something like, you know, I, I'm a Manica, as you know, did sometimes devise treatments around the zones. His um, pancreatitis treatment was yeah. devised around um, zones, zone six. Uh, so so basically spleen um it's not spleen six it's spleen seven is right in the seven, spleen seven. zone yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so he and the lung point is right in the spleen zone on the arm so he 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 devised his treatments with the hirata zones in mind so i think that's a good thing to think about okay thank you 
There are a couple of kind of practical questions, one of which is about, do you have to be formally trained to be able to use this technique in the UK and Europe? Um, I guess what I'd like to maybe say to that is, um, uh, you know, we don't have, you know, there's no kind of um, requirement, I guess, in terms of, um, you know, getting, uh, you know, we're not licensed, for example, like in Japan to be moxibustion specialists. Um, and people are doing CPD courses all the time. Um, <clears throat> but I guess in terms of um, safe practice um, and being safe to your patients as well, obviously doing some kind of formal training or, you know, obviously, um, you know, hands-on training is always better than just trying to learn something very practical off um, YouTube. But there's no, um, I think, uh, in, in terms of the UK, I can't speak for Europe, our insurance covers us for acupuncture and moxibustion, certainly within the um, British Acupuncture Council. I can't talk for other professional bodies. So you would have to check your own professional body health and safety guidelines um, and to make sure that you're compliant with that. Um, one of the other questions is about how do you, can you, do you stop the moxa and stop it and, and make sure it doesn't burn your fingers? So uh, we've got another six minutes, Oren, just to let you know, but a few mm. other practical questions like that. Uh, right. I think that the practical questions um, can be answered uh, through some of the resources that are online. Um, so uh, I think one of the questions I saw was, how do I get the handout? So can you just paste that link into the chat again? Uh, um, I did. I've done it a couple yeah. of times, but I'll do it once yeah. again. Yeah, there, yeah. There might, yeah. So there's a link in the chat and that link sends you to a sign up form. And if you sign up, put your email in the form, it will send you, it will send you the handout. So there you go. Uh, so anyone doesn't have the handout, please just uh, use that um, link. Mm. Now I'm going to um, share my screen again. Uh, just very um, quickly, talking... somebody said, can Hirata zones be used for root treatment? I think what Oren just showed in his demonstration is that you can do just Hirata's own treatment if you want uh, to yeah. address. Yeah, so let's just quickly define what root treatment means. Root treatment means triggering the body's own regulatory mechanism. So root treatment in Toyahari is balancing the five uh, elements the, you know, so that they are in harmony, so that the body is regulated and therefore heals itself. Manika talked about um, balancing the octahedron. And in Hirata's own therapy, if you want to do root treatment, you want to do stuff that's going to trigger the body's healing mechanism. And your way into that is to use those three correspondence systems, either Western medicine, uh, acupuncture correspondences, or location, to guide you to choose the right zones to balance the body. Thank you for that question. Um, Okay, next steps. If you want to learn more about Hirata Zones, uh, uh, first of all, download the handout if you didn't already, because that will um, tell you, uh, basically summarize the information that I presented. Uh, secondly, uh, you can contact the organizers, uh, either Marion or Michael Huber, who are, um, uh, mm, organizing the two Hirata events in next November. Now, if you see that link uh, here, uh, I, I'm hoping you can see my little red arrow, orincaviti.com slash events. Uh, if you copy down that link, um, then you will come to my website and that will show you all the teaching events uh, in the coming month. And you will be able to, uh, if you want to join the event, you can. And Marion has provided a coupon code Hirata48, which gets you a discount if you book within the next 48 hours. And Michael has done the same. He's just extended the early bird for till October 17th. So if you want to register for Munich or for London, uh, then by all means do so soon within the next 48 hours. And just copy down that uh, coupon code Hirata48. 48. 48 hours, sounds like a movie, Hirata48. Um, you can also read the book if you wish, uh, and the book is available wherever you want to get it. Um, 
just a quick word uh, about the book cover, because some people are say, well, why is that woman in that posture? So that's the reason uh, she's in the she's uh, mimicking Hirata because he did a lot of postures which stretched the meridians. So he worked a lot on um, postures and that's kind of the third wing of his therapy, if you like. OK, thank you very much for listening. Um, how are we doing for time? We've got a couple uh, of minutes. Two more left. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah, I. I, I, for me, I found that Hirata has kind of transformed my thinking much in the way that uh, uh, Manika talked about it, making everything three dimensional. But particularly, I like to use it for diagnosis because I very often palpate my patients' legs and arms before I start treatment. It's my way of kind of making contact with people. And I found very reliably that when people have lumbar pain, they get very stiff in the upper thigh. Uh, treat in the upper thigh area in zones nine and 10. So that's become a very reliable way for me. If I'm palpating someone, I feel that the upper thigh is tight just above the knee and just above that. Then I ask them, do you get lumbar pain? And they go, oh yes, I do. How did you know? And I say, and is it worse on the right? And they say, oh yes, it is. How did you know? And it's because the zones uh, get um, reactive. So that's a very useful thing for me from a diagnostic point of view, as well as from a treatment point of view. So yeah, um, I wish you well. I hope you um, investigate Ontake. I hope you investigate Hirata and uh, I hope to see you in the future. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Marion, for hosting. Lovely to see everybody. Thank you for coming on a Saturday and hope to see some of you on the workshops that are coming up. Great, thank you.